All right, everybody. Uh, good evening. My name is Ian Andrews, and I'm the executive director at Lakewood Alive. We're thrilled to have you uh, join us for uh, Knowing Your Home, How to Contract or Repair, featuring our Housing Internal Operations Director, Allison Urbanic. Allison's going to join us in just one moment. Uh, would remind you, please, ask some questions. Uh, Allison uh, has a ton of knowledge. Uh, this is this workshop series uh, is uh, her brainchild and just something that has been so much fun to be a part of, and, and I've enjoyed being able to to watch and learn so much. So I hope you'll learn something tonight. So please ask your questions, put them in the comment uh, thought bubble, uh, and then we will read them uh, throughout the course of the evening. Uh, so unless there's anything else, Allison, uh, go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us today for Knowing Your Home, How to Contract or Repair. Uh, this is the seventh season of Knowing Your Home, which is mind blowing to me. Uh, that we have been able to uh, find fun and exciting workshops for seven seasons, and we're still going very strong and looking forward to another seven. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we will be focusing on how to contract a repair, uh, how to save you time, um, resources, and tiers. I really emphasize the word tiers. I think we've all been frustrated when working with a contractor or trying to figure out how to get something accomplished uh, and has you know, been very frustrated. So today we're gonna find uh, and identify some tips, but also we're just gonna come together and share stories and really just figure out maybe some uh, tips that you can share with us, that we can share with others uh, to help us um, win the battle of contracting repair. So as Ian mentioned, uh, I'm Allison Urbanic. I'm the Housing and Internal Operations Director at Lakewood Alive. Uh, I joined the team in 2013 uh, and helped to grow the housing outreach program to what it is today. Uh, it's an umbrella program that really has a mission of ensuring that all Lakewood residents are living in healthy and safe housing. And one of the ways we believe we can do that is by educating folks on how to maintain uh, and improve our 80 to 100 plus year old homes. Uh, I, I always say the relationship with my house is complicated. It's like a Facebook status. Uh, it's a love-hate thing. And uh, one day I love this house more than anything else in the entire world. And the next day I'm ready to pack up and move to a brand new condo uh, in Phoenix. So, um, you know, this is something that uh, we really try to strive to provide you with tips and tools to ensure a job well done. So I will be taking questions throughout the presentation. Uh, so please feel free to submit those in the chat box uh, and then we'll get those out there and ask all questions. There are no silly questions. We really wanna get that information out there. Or again, if you have tips that or tricks that you wanna share with us so that we can share them with the group, please feel free. Uh, next slide, Ian. Great. So. What I like to do is uh, ask folks, what types of repairs are you looking to have done? You know, what is your end goal? What do you hope to accomplish here? And these pictures, the before pictures, you can see the caution tape, you can see that the stairs have collapsed, you can see the overgrown bushes. Uh, so really we know that the end goal on this project is get new stairs so people can safely uh, get up there on the porch and visit or drop off some takeout food or whatever. We want to get those steps in good repair. And we also want to take down those bushes a little further. We probably could have taken them down a little further in this picture, but the homeowner really liked them. But, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? Next slide. And uh, so we want to identify our project. What are we trying to accomplish? But before we move further, we really want to address our frustrations. I get phone calls every single day of, from people who are saying, Allison, I want to get my steps replaced. I want to replace my uh, roof. I want to do X, Y, and Z, put an addition on my house. Uh, but no one is calling me back. Or people come out and they never give me an estimate. Um, sometimes I hear that people gave deposits and the contractors never came back. Or sometimes I hear that they hire someone, that person seems like they know what they're doing, and then they're in the middle of a project and that person doesn't know anything and they're worse off than when they started out the project. Does anyone else have any other frustrations that they wanna share? Let it all out. This is a great opportunity uh, for us to really just 
be cathartic about this. I personally um, am trying to get an addition put onto my house. Uh, and it took two years to get a full estimate. Two years to get a full estimate. I went through probably about five contractors. They were referred to me from people who said, this is the guy, Allison. This guy, you're going to love him. He's going to solve all your problems. You're going to get the addition of your dreams. The guy came out, never saw him again. Or the guy came out, said, yeah, this is great. This is great. We're going to get you an estimate. You're going to be real happy. And then I never heard anything again. And people call and they say, Allison, how can I get them to call me back? Or how can I get them to give an estimate? I can't even get people to do that. So these are common frustrations. Uh, and again, we're going to learn some tips and tricks how to try to minimize those things when working with contractors. Next slide. All right. So we're going to shake it off. We're going to look at our friend Taylor Swift. We are going to dust off our shoulders. We are going to get all of our bad vibes off and we are going to now move forward so that we can have successful relationships with our contractors. All right, Ian, let's shake it off. All right, where to start? So where I can say is that you need to be comfortable with the repairs that you are looking to do. You need to identify those things what you want your end goal to be. It's okay if you don't know how you're going to get there, but it's really important for you to know what you want at the end. So personally, um, you know, initially I started off with, I wanted a full addition on the back of my house, a two-story addition with a full basement addition as well. We were ready to make the commitment. We were ready to take my money. Let's go. And I feel like the contractors were overwhelmed with that request of getting a full addition put on our house. We were talking to them and we were very open-ended. We weren't really giving a lot of detailed information other than this is really, you know, we want to have a two-story addition, but we didn't have a ton of information to give them otherwise. And I think people looked at our 1906 home. They looked at the project as a daunting one that they didn't even, you know, there was a lot of unknowns and we kept saying, well, we need to know a price. You know, we can't do anything until we get an honest to goodness price. So I think it was just a lot for us to digest as well as a contractor to digest. So I think that's why we weren't getting a lot of um, completed estimates and a lot of excited contractors. We decided to then um, kind of half our project and put a full bathroom on our first floor as well as redo our kitchen, add some storage um, and a new entrance to our back deck. So we'll keep continuing to talk about my project throughout this conversation. So again, we want to identify the reasons of why you want to get the work done. So is it a health or safety issue? Do you have mold growing in your basement or is your roof leaking? Have you been cited by the city? Are you thinking about your next stage in life? Are you looking to make your home your forever home? So you're thinking about making some aging in place improvements? Or is it really, you're thinking about your next house, you're thinking about the new next phase in your life and you wanna just do some cosmetic work to add some resale value so that you can put your house on the market and find the next home for you. Why are you doing this project? And the reason why I ask you to think about that is because it comes down to cost. Are you ready to do the Taj Mahal of projects, the Cadillac, or are you looking just to get that Chevy? You wanna just get the lipstick on the pig and move on. Next slide. All right, so we want to do our homework. And when I say that, you can do half-assed homework, you can do full homework, however you want to do it. You need to do some homework, though, to really understand where, again, you're trying to go, your goal. So learn as much about the repair as possible. And when I say that, learn as much as you need. You don't need to learn exactly how to do it, but you do need to learn roughly what the process entails. So if the guy's gonna say, well, I'm gonna put a who's he, what's it on your roof, you know what that who's he, what's it is, so that you can be informed while making the decision. So how do you do your homework? Well, in this day and age, there's a ton of options, almost probably too many options. So here are a few ways for you to do it. Call the building department at City Hall. Now, I realize this presentation was written in pre-pandemic times, but uh, 
you can call the building department and they will do a virtual inspection with you. You could fire up your iPad or your smartphone and walk around and say, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think I should do? Um, you can also ask them if your repair needs a permit. That's important information for you to know. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. You can also do some online research. This old house um, is a wonderful resource for folks, especially with older homes. You know, you're not going to want to pull up a handyman who is fixing um, a 1997 house because that is not going to compare to our 1906 houses. So you want to make sure you're doing an apples to apples comparison of learning. So this old house or perhaps a YouTube for um, some older things. Family Handyman is another great resource for you. Do a little online research. Watch a couple videos. My favorite, though, is Glenn Palmer at Lakewood Hardware, as well as um, anyone down at Cleveland Lumber. They're very uh, knowledgeable. And we have a new research ability, our new tool here at Lakewood Alive, and it's the Lakewood Toolbox. We have uh, Matt Clark. He is on our staff. So not only can I help you, Matt Clark can help you. Uh, and if it's something that you're planning to do yourself, uh, Matt Clark can also give you some uh, insight into how to get it done and what tools to use. We have a lot of research, or I'm sorry, we have a lot of resources at our fingertips that can help you get a little bit of knowledge under your belt to help you be more informed when talking to contractors and ultimately making final decisions. Next slide. Okay, so also you can go to the library uh, and uh, find a book if you'd like to do that. Um, but as I said before, you need to know why you're getting that repair done. Is it a repair? Is it an improvement? Or are you making something new and modern? And again, that comes down to cost. What are you willing to spend to get the job done? So if you're going to repair something, that means you're just going to leave it as it is now, but you're just going to make it in working order. If you're going to make an improvement, say you want to replace that dishwasher, it means it's going to be taken out. You're going to put in something new that's quieter, um, probably a little bigger. Um, you know, just really it's an improvement on what you had or, you know, installing something new and modern. Maybe you're going to take out that tub and put in a walk-in shower uh, with a nice seat in it uh, and some grab bars in it um, to you know make it safer but even more visually appealing. So really think about what you're trying to accomplish with this project. Next slide. Okay, so as I mentioned, you want to do your homework. So not only are you going to do your homework on uh, the repair that you're looking to get done, you also want to do some homework on how to find a contractor. So when you are hiring someone, you want to ensure that that contractor is registered in the city of Lakewood. That means that they um, have the approval to work in the city, means that they haven't caused a lot of problems on jobs or um, taken advantage of a lot of people who you know, have filed complaints with the city. So they're allowed to work. Then they also present proper insurance and bonding, meaning they are allowed to work. And if something happens to them or something happens to your home, they have proper insurance that will cover that and will help you get it back on track. You know, if they accidentally fall through your roof and someone gets hurt when they're repairing it, you want to ensure that they have that insurance to take care of that employee so that, you know, that employee maybe doesn't come after you. So it's really to protect you and, again, protect the people on the job, protect your neighbors. You know, if a ladder falls over and hits your neighbor's house, you do not want to be responsible that, for that. So you want to ensure that they have proper insurance. You can find out if someone is registered with the city by visiting onelakewood.com. Um, if you go to the building department, uh, it pulls up a list. You can also give them a call. You can say, hey, is so-and-so registered? Or, hey, can you mail me a list of your registered contractors? And they will do that. You can also contact me. Um, I, I, for, I didn't mention, but and if this is the second time you've heard this workshop or seen one of our workshops, I eat, breathe, sleep housing. I love housing. I love talking to people about home repairs. I love getting creative. I love trying to connect you to proper people to get the job well done. I live for this stuff. So feel free to reach out. You can email me, aurbanic at lakewoodalive.org. 
or give me a call, 216-521-0655, option three. We are working remotely currently, uh, but our members will call our cell phones. So I am here for you Monday through Friday, nine to five. Other options for you uh, would be to contact the Better Business Bureau. If you look up, I think it's bbbcleveland.org. Angie's List, you can get on there for free. Uh, it's a great resource. It's not something you want to live by. You don't want to go buy it because they're just like anything else on Angie's List. You can pay some money uh, to be listed as like a super duper superstar. But it's a good starting place for you to at least see if someone has some negative comments. Um, it's a great place. Online resources are a great place for warnings. Most people, if they had a job well done, they're happy. They tend to not get online and say anything. Sometimes they will if someone asks them. But if they had something go wrong, you know they're getting online and they're going to tell everyone about it. They're going to paste it on the Facebook pages. They're going to paste it on the Better Business Bureau Angie's List, wherever they can. They're going to tell you when you're passing in the street, do not hire this person. So make sure you look online. Now, friends. Uh, friends are really important. You can use them. You can ask people what it was like when the people were in the house, what it was like when they were getting um, finishing a job, how they were asking for payments. You know, you can get some really hands-on experience by talking to your friends. I do want to add, though, online. So I don't know if you, like me, are in the Facebook community pages, Lakewood, Ohio, and Lakewood Community, and all those things. And I swear 12 times a day, people say, hey, do you know where a good plumber is? Can you find them? And then it seems like this one person pops up for every single thing, jack of all trades, they know everything, or my friend's cousin's brother is a really great blah, 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 you should give them a call. I really encourage you to not use those places as a resource. You can use them, but then do your own research once you get those names to ensure that John Smith really can do X, Y, and Z, and you're not up a creek if you hire him. So please do research. Again, call us, call the billing department. The Better Business Bureau is an amazing resource. So do your homework uh, when looking into contractors. Next slide. Okay, getting estimates. So we know it's hard to get contractors to come through your door to give you an estimate. And I know that you meet some guy and you really like him. He seems to know what he's doing. And your cousin told you he was so great. You need to get two estimates. You need to get two well-written estimates to be able to compare apples to apples. And I'm telling you this, and I know that you know it, but I'm telling you again, it is so important to get two estimates that are apples to apples, well-written estimates, so that you can compare what you're really getting for the price. And if you hire someone and it becomes a contract, you want to make sure that everything is included in that estimate and contract. So at the end of the day, if something doesn't get done as it's supposed to, you can turn around and put your finger on that contract and say, you told me it was going to be X, Y, and Z and you gave me Q. So as long as it's in writing, it's detailed, you have that kind of protection right there written in paper to help you get your job well done. So if you only get one estimate, I really, really, really encourage you to reach out to someone else, get another estimate, make sure you can compare apples to apples. Now, before you start getting estimates, it goes back to the very beginning of why are you getting something done and what are you trying to accomplish? Make sure you have that written down. You can type it up, you can handwrite it, whatever you wanna do, and give a copy to the contractor that comes out every time so that when they're writing their estimate, they can ensure to include all of the things that you're hoping to get done. That way you're going to get that apples to apples comparison for pricing and ensuring that you know, everything gets accomplished that you're hoping it will. Next slide. Okay, so we're still getting estimates. You're gonna get two estimates. You're gonna get three estimates and that's ideal. Um, the economy is changing. We are going to see a big swing with contractors. Uh, 
the economy was really good. Everyone was getting work done to their houses. And I hate to say it, and I'm really sad about it. Um, and our, we're entering into a new world here. But work is not going to be as easy to come by for contractors now. So you are going to see more estimates coming through to you. You are going to see more people returning calls. So you have to be just as vigilant uh, and using that to your advantage so you can get a good price and, again, get all the work done that you hope to get accomplished. So write down, make a list of all the things you hope to accomplish, um, get those estimates, and never sign an estimate the day that you get it. Um, I'm going to kind of take a little side tangent here. Um, there is a company out there that does waterproofing. Um, you may see them at home shows. They tend to have senior citizens that are handing out T-shirts and really pushing you to sign up for an estimate that day. Uh, or if you sign up to get more information and they call you every day to get you to come out and, you know, get an estimate. It's important that you sleep on an estimate. High pressure sales, it almost sounds too good to be true. That one company that I'm talking about, if you don't sign with them that day, they're going to call you back tomorrow and say they talked to their boss and they were able to get 30% off just like that in an instant. And then they're going to call you the next day and offer some other magical things. It's important for you to sleep on it, make sure that it's what you want to do, and then sign your estimate in your, to make it a legally binding contract. You have a three-day right to cancel period. Do you want to make sure you're crossing your T's, dotting your I's, and you're really thinking about this before you move forward? After those three days, you're in a legally binding contract. So you're going to have to figure out how to get out of that if it's something you decide you don't want to do. So just know, never sign that estimate or contract the first day. Sleep on it. Think about it. Make sure you have your ducks in a row. Uh, and then go ahead and sign that contract if you feel good about it. Next slide. All right. So make sure you get this in writing. Everything needs to be written down. Uh, I don't know about you, but I can barely remember what I had for breakfast, especially in these times of working from home. There's a lot going on. Um, I think I've started seven emails and I've only sent three of them because I get distracted. So if it's happening this easily to me, imagine what's going on with a contractor who is working with five to 10 people trying to get their projects moving. So make sure everything that you want is in writing. Make sure you agree to everything before you sign it. If there's something that's not clear to you, ask questions. I like to call it the I know what I'm talking about trick. Uh, like if you're getting a roof replaced, you can say, how much ice guard are you gonna put on the valleys of my house? That's really not magic language, it's how much rubber roofing are you going to put down in the places that meet another part of my house? So if you have a dormer, you know, where the dormer meets your roof, how much rubberized roofing are they going to put there? But if you throw out some jargon, uh, some words, and I can give you those words, if you need a pep talk or whatever, or what you're doing your research online, or what's the warranty on this? What's your labor warranty versus what's the material warranty? Or how many other houses have you put in this material on in town and can I go and see them? If something's not clear, uh, you know, are they going to be putting tarps down when they're painting your house? Doesn't say anything about tarping and you would hate for them to scrape your house without any tarps down, right? Because it's going to leave paint chips. They could be lead-based paint chips all over the place. Um, or if it doesn't say they're going to clean up after themselves every day after they go home and it's a long weekend and then you're having people over and there are paint chips all over your backyard. If there's something that is not clear, ask for clarity. If there's something you want changed, make an addendum onto that estimate or to that contract and have you both sign it. Make sure you're clear on what type of materials. You know, do you want a slate gray roof and they put on a stable brown roof? Make sure all that stuff is spelled out before you sign that contract. You also want to know about your warranty. Is that warranty something that you have to send in to activate, or does your roofing contractor mail that in? Asking questions is what we need to do to get clarity, and there's nothing wrong with asking questions. If someone gets annoyed with you asking questions, then perhaps that contractor is not the right person for you. Uh, 
you know, you have a right to know you're in charge. You are the driving the car. You're paying the bill. They are providing you a service. Um, and then our big question is, does a repair need a permit? That is a big question. We're going to talk about permits, but you need to ask that contractor. If you go on onelakewood.com under the building department, there is a list of all jobs that require a permit. There are things that probably surprise you that will require a permit. Pulling, uh, moving an electrical outlet, I believe needs a permit. Don't quote me on that. Um, a new toilet replacement may need a permit, uh, but there's a long laundry list of things. So you want to make sure that you're informed. You can find that list. If you're not sure if something needs a permit, you can go ahead and call the building department. But I like to ask that contractor that question and see what they say to me. I already know the answer, and hopefully they're going to tell me the right answer. And if they don't, I'm going to call them on it and find out why they were saying that. Next slide. All right, so we're getting estimates. We're talking to our contractors. Let's use my example. I'm going to put in a full bathroom on my first floor. Currently, I have a half bathroom, and I'm going to read you my kitchen. It's a kitchen that's in desperate need of attention. And I'm going to put in a nice sliding door to get out onto my back deck. So why am I making these improvements? Am I looking for a good cost, good quality, and do I want it to last a long time? Yes, yes, and yes. But I know that I'm willing to spend a little bit more money in my kitchen because I want luxury vinyl tiles. I have three dogs. You may or may not hear them behind me. Um, they have nails uh, that um, leave marks. So I want to have a nice high quality vinyl that I'm willing to pay for. I also want to have some heavy duty, nice countertops that I can put hot stuff on and not have to worry about it. Currently, I have four mica countertops that are white. Why in the world would anyone do that? I don't know. Uh, they, I put a wine glass down, and I am a, I don't spill. That's, that's against the rules. But sometimes it's will drip. And that wine will sit on my white for mica countertops for, until I get out my um, magic eraser and they go away. So... I know that I want to invest in my countertops because that is important to me. So really identifying the places or talking to your contractor and saying, these are important to me. I have this budget. What can we do to get into that budget? So understanding where your must versus wants and needs are, so wants versus needs, and making sure you're on the same level as your partner. If there's someone making decisions with you, make sure you two are on the same page. Uh, my husband and I, we hired an architect before we went through this. I don't know that I would do that again, but I did it at first because we have opposite tastes. We were able to talk it through. We created some drawings. We didn't do final plans, just some drawings so that we could kind of have our little discussions and our needs versus wants list. We both decided what was important to both of us. And we prioritized and made those lists together. So when we did talk to a contractor, we looked like we have our stuff together uh, and that we are composed and uh, we aren't going to cause problems down the line. Um, okay, so when you're getting your estimates, make sure you kind of have this sorted out in your mind and make sure that you have your listing of things that you're providing to the contractor. So next, we want to ask who is doing the work. I always use this example. Um, I got a new roof on my house when I first bought my house. This is my 11th year in my house. And I talked to this really great guy, um, dressed very nicely, very professionally, had his clipboard, came out, had his ladders, told me all these things about what I was getting. Um, and back then, I didn't know all the questions to ask. I was just new to learning about housing at that time. And so I didn't think to ask. Are you going to take pictures when you're on my roof? Show me rotted wood. Um, you know, when are you going to be doing the work? I sign a contract. I think that the crew is going to show up in a couple of weeks. And it turns out it's like two months later. Uh, and it's like the D crew, not the A, not the B, not the C crew, but the D crew. Um, no one could, no one wanted to communicate with me. No one wanted to stop and tell me what was happening. Um, I'm going to go through some tactics with you. I was practicing my tactics of being present. 
uh, asking questions uh, and nobody could give me the time of day. If I would have asked, you know, will I have a contact when someone's out there doing the work? Who do I talk to when I have questions? Now I ask that. I did not ask that before. I didn't know to do that. But I was really taken aback when it's November. It's very windy. They're coming out to put my roof on. I have a very pitched roof. I'm worried that people are going to fly off in this terrible November weather. Um, and then they mailed me a bill. No one stopped to say, oh, we replaced wood in the rear uh, on your rear roof and we replaced um, wood in the front of your house. No one stopped. I just got this bill that was about uh, $800 more than I expected it to be. So who's doing the work? Who is my point of contact? And also, are these your employees or are you subcontracting? Uh, you know, who is coming out and doing the work? Uh, next slide. I have to say these presentations are way more fun when I can see your faces. Uh, and hear you interacting with me. So I miss all of you. I just wanted to take a moment and say that. Um, so getting our estimate. Uh, there's going to be two or three slides moving forward. So this is our first slide here. Andrew's home improvement. Uh, it's handwritten, very messy, just a phone number, no contact information other than that. You don't know where they work out of, you don't know who owns it, you don't know if they're licensed and bonded, there's no legal jargon on there. Uh, for this improvement, they're going to come out and fix your step, they're going to repair the rail, and they're going to add some mortar to the brick and it's going to be $650. Next slide. Okay, so here we are. Now, these are not apples to apples estimates, but we're looking at this one because it has more detail. So this is a roof replacement estimate. Um, you see that there's a lot more detail. You know where the company is located. You have a phone number, a website, a fax number, if people even still use those. Um, and they're telling you this is their scope of work. Um, here's a phone number for the rep, James Jenkins. And he's going to remove the furnace stack from the back of the house, remove shingles from around the stack area, um, they're going to put in new rafters, um, and they're going to install 30 feet of one by six decking. They're going to install ice and water shield. Uh, so the work above is going to cost $1,075. You're putting $350 down, and then the balance is due at the completion of the job. So the reason why I present this to you is because this is a middle ground estimate. The first one was awful. This one is a middle ground. You understand what kind of products they're installing, how much they're installing, where they're doing the work, um, and they're telling you about the cost. So it's the total cost and how you're going to pay for that. Next slide. This is the Cadillac of estimates. So this is another roofing estimate. Um, it's halfway pre-written, so there's a lot of the stuff. And that's to be expected. It's a roofing company. They're going to be doing the things over and over again. But the nice thing is that most of it's printed. So it's easier to read than the previous one. The previous one, the handwriting was okay. Uh, but, you know, you had to spend a little bit of time to try to read it. This is already pre-printed. They're just kind of filling in the blanks and they're adding their own detail. So they're telling you how much of roofing, what kind of shingles they're going to put on. So it's an architectural shingle that has a 30-year lifetime warranty, or I'm sorry, a 30-year warranty. Um, what kind of shingles? So they're going to be using black. The current shingle is black. They're going to turn it to black existing shingle color. So it's going to be the black color. They're going to put white drip edge, um, and then there's going to be an underlayment under it. Um, so there's a lot of information here that they're telling you. Um, roofing vents, they're putting in four vents. Um, and then if the chimney is brick, they're going to do um, some splashing around that, blah, blah, blah. So what I'm saying is this is what it should look like. Your estimate should be easy to read. It should be very detailed. It should include warranty information. It should also include how long, so the price is good for 30 days. There's a five-year workmanship warranty. 
And then wood replacement is additional if needed. This is very important for a roofing estimate. $50 a sheet, $5 a foot. If any of you are doing any specific repairs, please put that in the uh, chat box or the questions. We can talk about specific repairs if you'd like. Roofing is a nice one. Uh, there's, it's very detailed. You do need to be very specific. Um, most people don't know that any wood replacement cost is additional. They also don't realize that if you get your roof replaced, if you have anything in your attic, if you have an open attic, they don't clean up all of those little asphalt, uh, little gritty thing all over. They just leave it there and you have to clean it up. And I've heard horror stories of people leaving wedding dresses and baptism gowns and you know, real precious things up there in the attic and they get destroyed because people don't realize that that's what's gonna happen. So I like to talk with people about specific repairs and I'm happy to do that with all of you so that you can be prepared for any things that pop up. Um, okay, so this is a really well-written estimate, um, very well spelled out. That's what we're encouraging you to get from your contractors. Next slide. All right, so we're evaluating the information. We want to make sure that it's readable. If there's anything that you want clarification on, if there's any questions or missing information, you want to make sure that that gets added before you're signing that contract. Make sure that there's a name and an address. You want to just, I mean, you're probably never going to go visit them, but it's important to know that they care enough about their business that they're going to tell you where they are. To me, it's a red flag if you do not know where to find someone. That is just red flag, red flag, red flag. Uh, and does the estimate look professional? Nowadays, you pull up Word and there are estimate templates that you can just print off. Or there are pre-printed ones at Office Max. If they can't go to the store or they can't pull up a computer and create a professional looking estimate, that might be something that you want to decide that you don't want in your contractor. I want someone who's willing to take the time and share with me information that's important, like an estimate, so that I know what I'm getting, I know how much I'm paying, and I know what my warranty, warranty and labor warranties look like. Next slide. Okay, so Ian, what are those projects that people are working on? Yeah, so uh, Chris, hi Chris, great to hear from you, is working on a bathroom remodel. Uh, and Jane is converting a half bath to a full bath, uh, that sounds uh, phenomenal, with potential dormer additions, so quite a project. Okay, and Jane, if you could let us know, are are you going to be living in this house for a long time. Um, are you thinking about uh, adding any sort of aging in place or mobility assist in that in that bathroom, um, added studs so that you can put in grab bars, anything like that? I'm not sure um, if you've thought about that, but if you are, please let me know. And Chris, um, bathroom. Okay, Chris. Great. Sorry, guys. I'm usually on the question side of things, not the one doing the presentation. Um, all right. One second here. Bathroom. Personal siding, siding. Okay. And then the person who is getting the siding, Rebecca, um, are you doing... What kind of siding do you have, Rebecca? Do you have wood siding? Uh, do you have um, cedar shake siding? Okay, and then we've got uh, flat garage roof and likely some of the walls. Okay, and a front porch repair. Dave, are you considering getting any sort of PVC or plastic product as your flooring, or are you doing tongue and groove again? Or decking, treated lumber. Oh, I miss all of you. I wish we were in person together. Uh, wood siding. Okay, Rebecca. Great. We'll talk about that. Uh, and Jen, um, with your flat garage roof, I, I would love to set up a time to chat with you, uh, really just about the products that are available, um, and just see where you are in your estimate gathering. 
Okay, and then Jane, you're not planning to do any aging in place accommodations. You already have a walk-in shower on the first floor. That's amazing. And would like to add a tub on the second floor, new bath. Great. I would probably just ask them, though, to double stud your uh, bathroom up there just in case you want to add a grab bar in there uh, in the future. I think about my 37-year-old body, and some days it's hard to get out of the bathtub. So um, just a thought. Okay, cool. Great, great, great. All right, I'm going to put you guys on pause for just a little bit longer. We're going to talk a little bit more. Um, it's so great to hear about all the great things that you're doing in your home. All right. I think. Okay. All right. So you've gotten your estimates. Um, and just one other thing have any of you gotten estimates if you want to let us know? Um, and how you have found that process. If there's anything you want me to speak to specifically, I am being very general. I'm happy to add on additional things. Again, you can always call me after this presentation. I would love to chat with you further specifically about your repairs. Okay, so um, I hate to tell you this, but if it's not written in the estimate, it's not gonna be done. If the guy's saying, oh, you wanna have real fancy tile, I'm just gonna put on here, we're gonna put in, um, linoleum, but don't worry for you. I'm going to upgrade you to the finest Italian flooring I can find. It's probably not going to happen, uh, or, or it's going to be an upcharge that you didn't expect, and it's going to cause things to get awkward. This is also where I really push back on hiring family members to do repairs for you. You know, if your dad's coming over to do something, or your brother, and they're doing something real quick or something simple, great, take advantage of that. But if they're doing larger projects, it tends to lead to awkward situations. Either something takes too long, or something doesn't get installed correctly, or they bought the wrong color of something and installed it and you didn't realize it. Um, things get real sticky with family or close friends, and it's really hard to get past that. Uh, so just if you decide to use those people to do repairs for you, make sure you have a well-written estimate and you enter into it like a professional contract you would with anyone else. Just take all precautions just because you don't want awkward situations. Next slide. Okay, so we're checking our references, whether that's calling the building department, uh, or it's calling Lakewood Alive, I'm gonna tell you if I've heard things. If I've heard positive things, if I've heard negative things, if I heard I'm not so sure things, I would never give out a name of a contractor unless I would hire them in my house. So please know that. Um, and I, the building department, they're very open and honest. They're gonna tell you what it's like to work with a contractor, and they're gonna tell you if they're registered with them or not. So you take advantage of our great building department, but then also the hardware store. I know that I have um, worked with a contractor before. Um, I really liked them. I worked with a contractor again. I did not like them the second time. I shared that with the hardware store. And they said, oh yeah, we noticed a difference in this contractor too. So it's really great both ways to share your knowledge with us or other people that you're getting references from. So really just check them or ask people for where have you done work? Have you repaired steps here in Lakewood? Can I drive past them? And if you're bold, I am not that person, believe it or not. I'm probably not going to hop out of my car and go knock on someone's door unless I know them or have it prearranged. But if you are bold and like to do that, knock on the door. How was it working with so-and-so? When was the job done? Was it a year ago? Was it five years ago? Would you hire them again? Um, you know, really use that to your advantage. But you could just drive by, take a look, see if it looks good. That's, that's a reference check and something that you should do. Um, check your inner references. So when I was little, my mom would always say, how does your stomach feel about this? You know, I would get real emotional and I would probably get a stomach ache if I was upset about something. And so I still use my stomach test. I sleep on things. I put things in my Amazon cart and they stay there for like two weeks because I'm not sure I want to pull the trigger. So I am someone who sleeps on things and really encourage you to adopt that habit as well. But also just to look on the inside. When they were there, the person who was doing the work, did you feel comfortable with them? Did you get that weird like little radar thing going off in your head that something's not right here? 
Um, or were you comfortable? Is that someone who you want to be alone with or have your family members alone with while work is being done? Um, will you feel safe with them one on one? And if you don't, maybe that's a reason to not hire them or bring over someone to be with you while work is being done. You know, we always want to promote safety first. Safety first. Do you feel safe about this person? Um, I had some painters. We have not. I personally did not, but through our program, we had a client who ha hired a painter and the contractors kept peeing behind their garage instead of going to a local establishment to use the restroom. And then people were smoking pot. Yeah, we had to go nip that real fast. Um, so you really just want to be aware of who's coming to your house and spending a lot of time there. So do as many gut checks and reference checks as you can um, before signing a contract. Next slide, please. Okay, so we kind of talked about this already, but you know, you if it's a roof color or some work being done, you can ask people windows, um, exterior painting, drive past and look at people's houses. I have like a bluish roofing material on my house, asphalt shingles. And we drove around before we made the bold choice of a bluish uh, roofing material. We drove around and looked at it and saw what it looked like on people's houses before we decided to pull the trigger. I love it. I think it looks great. It's a nice little accent. But I probably would be very nervous about it if I didn't check it out before I got it done. Same with exterior painting colors. Um, paint a little swatch on your house or go and look at another house that has a similar color. Oftentimes we hear from people, I want my house to be the same color as the house down the street. So make sure you kind of have it because that's a big investment and something you're probably going to be living with for a very long time. The average exterior painting job lit lasts about seven years. So that's a long time of committing to a color, especially if you haven't tried it out. Um, and the same would be for shingle colors. So most roofing companies will give you a list of places that have your roofing color around. Um, and you can also Talk to your painters and see if it's a popular color that you've used. Or again, you're getting your house painted anyway. Throw some paint up there and uh, look at it for a couple days before you pull the trigger on it. Next slide. Okay, Ian, I'm going to hand the questions back to you again. If anything pops up, please let me know. Um, yeah, sure thing. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, okay, so when you're talking to people about references, again, asking how long ago the work was completed. If the work was completed like two months ago, people may not know how they feel about the work. So you're going to probably want to talk to someone who's had work done at least a year or so later. Um, you know, everything is rose-colored glasses when you get something done. It's so wonderful. It's clean. It's new. You've been working so hard to get something accomplished. You really need a little bit of time for reality to set in before you can decide if you really like something. So when talking to people, ask them how long ago it was when the work was done. Um, ask them if they had any issues or talk to a contractor. If I have issues, how are we going to remedy them? What's going to happen? How do I need to tell you about the issues if there's something? You know, we find this often with people who go through our paint program, um, you know, they've missed a few spots or they've left paint chips places. And uh, I asked the contractor up front, how do you want us to deal with this situation? I want to make sure I'm approaching it the way you want me to because I want to have some good results at the end. It's okay that things weren't done exactly right. It just really matters how they come through and fix them or repair them or make them right at the end. That is the important part. So asking contractors up front, how do you want to do this? You know, what's the best way for me to deal with this? Um, you know, these are my expectations. How can I approach you about them? Um, so talking to people who've had work done, you can definitely ask them about fixing things. The fact, again, that they had to have something fixed is not the issue. It's how the contract, track, contractor remedied the situ, situation. Excuse me. Um, and then also asking someone, would you use them again? I can tell you there are some people that I will not use again. There are some people that I will. And I you know, try to find work to get them done because they're so great. And I just want to use them as much as I can while I have them, um, you know, kind of at my grasp. So check your references, very, very important. Next slide. 
Hey, Allison, we do have a question from Kim. Uh, she asks, do you have any advice for getting a handyman to do lots of little jobs? Oh, Kim, 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 I wish. Um, I do have a few people. Um, I'm not going to give them out through this dialogue, so you can feel free to reach out. Um, but you're spot on. It's hard to find contractors to do little projects. Uh, so we, you know, you want to kind of bundle those together. I do have a few people, um, and I find that handymen, you either love them or you hate them. And also everyone loves them or hates them. So they're either really jumping to get work done because maybe they're not the best and they have a lot of free time, but then also they might be new and just getting into things. So, um, I would make sure that you bundle up some repairs make sure you're bringing them in for several things um make sure that you know that the job doesn't need a permit oftentimes handymen are not registered with the city so that's something to be aware of um, and that is a good and a bad thing i guess good is how they can keep their prices low because they're doing small things that do not require permit so you can probably get them to do things a little bit more affordably the downside is that they're not registered so if something bad does happen, you if you went to the building department and say, Joe Smith, um, you know, ruined my front door and can you please help me? And they're going to say, I'm sorry, he's not registered. There's nothing I can do. So that's where the references really come in handy. Um, so I'm happy to talk with you further about that, um, whether it's via email or over the phone to talk a little bit further about that. Um, but yeah, so just remember handymen are generally not going to be registered with the city. So just be aware of that and also make sure you create your honey do list or whatever you want to call it and have him come in them, they, anyone, uh, and do a lot of, you know, a few things at one time instead of one, one off things. Cause that will probably save you money in the long run. Great. And, uh, okay. Jane just Next. simply wanted to echo and say we have the same issue with small projects. So you're all on the same page. We're gonna to go to the next slide now. Thank you. Okay, so we're kind of progressing through this. You know, we found our contractor, we've gotten our estimates. We're feeling good about the guy. We did our stomach check, we're sleeping at night, we're feeling good. So we're gonna move forward with our contractors. Now what? Talk about payments. So, Sometimes you're gonna see a contractor wanting 50% down. Sometimes you're gonna see they don't want any money until the job is completed. I have found that most times when people don't need money up front is because they're a large company. They have cash flow. Buying your materials isn't going to bankrupt them. They can go ahead and do that. So when working with a larger company, it's okay to not need money down. Like, that's great. You can push for that and see what they say. My, where I stand on down payments is if it's like $200 or $500, that makes sense to me. That's, I'm believing in you. I'm investing in this project. I'm committed. We're going to get this done. Um, but if someone needs 50% down, that's real hard for me to swallow. We do not get paid in advance. I didn't get my paycheck before I worked. I had to work to get my paycheck and I do believe that that's what contractors need to do as well. You may say, Allison, that's crazy talk. They're not gonna do my job. You can negotiate. And the negotiation tactic that I believe is good is you give them a little bit of money, $200, $500 down, depending on what the project is, and then deliver my materials to my house and I will hand you a check that day for the cost of the materials. So if the reason you're asking me for money up front is because you need to buy materials, I will give it to you, but you need to give me the materials. And that is if they walk off the job, if they never come back, you at least have those materials so you can bring someone else in to finish that job. If you give someone half the money down or a third of the money down, whatever it is, and they don't come back, you're out of the money and you don't even have your materials. So I have a really hard time, and I'm a stickler for this, in giving money up front for nothing. So when you are negotiating with your contractors, do what feels right, make sure they're registered with the city, 
make sure they're reputable and make sure you're getting materials for the money that you're putting down. Also discuss payment schedules. So if it's a larger project, so for the person who's possibly adding a dormer in the bathroom uh, or the, um, the flat roof, probably you're not gonna have to put any money down on. Um, but any of the larger projects, you wanna work out a payment schedule. Uh, I had some work done on my house. On the second floor, I needed some uh, drywall repair and some painting done. And it was a, it was supposed to take a month and I think it ended up taking like two and a half months. But we negotiated a payment schedule up front. That really was in my best interest because when things started to slow down and he needed to pay his contractors for doing work, I was on a payment scale schedule. So it was, you do this one room, I will pay you money. You do this other room, I will pay you money. But I don't, it's not my problem that it took two and a half months for you to do something that you told me was going to take a month. And he kept asking for money. And I said, no, we agreed upon this payment schedule. Now, I was paying for my materials along the way. So I myself was paying for the materials. So we were really just talking about the labor costs. But that payment schedule really, really helped me get my project done. And it, you know, I wasn't out any money because the job wasn't being done. So it really worked out. I encourage you to set up payment schedules, especially for larger projects. That will protect you if something takes longer. It's going to incentivize them to come back and get something done quicker because they're going to want to get paid. And also save a payment for the end. Always save a payment for the end. If something is not done to your liking, you have that payment that you're kind of hanging out there as the carrot or the stick, depending. Uh, I am not paying you until X, Y, and Z is done. You know, you told me you were going to put in that fancy Italian tile, and until it's on my floor, I'm not paying you that last payment. Very important for you to negotiate those things and have them written and being specific. So if it's that bathroom, you know, once you tile, you put in the sh um, new wonderful shower uh, and tub and the tile, I'm gonna pay you. When you put in the vanity and the new lighting, I will pay you. When you do paint the walls, I will pay you. Whatever it is, make sure it's spelled out. Also, you wanna set aside a contingency. Every project should have a 10 to 15% contingency cost built in. We all know with our older houses, and I hear it from contractors all the time, I don't want to work on your house because it's old and there's going to be a lot of unexpected things. At my house, we call it something was Uncle Franked. Uh, when I open up something and I find a rag where I thought a wall was, like I, um, they, in a couple places in my house, they drywall mudded over some rags to fill in some holes uh, instead of putting the drywall where it should have been. Um, so that's Uncle Frank. So you're gonna find some Uncle Frank stuff done in your house. You know, our houses have lived many, many lives before we got to them. I wanna give my house a hug every day just because of the abuse that it saw from previous owners. Uh, so there is gonna be unexpected costs. That's where that contingency plan comes into place. If you have that built in, you are not gonna be figuring out where these additional funds are coming from. You know, especially in larger projects, you know, you're already trying to set a budget and scraping or getting a loan or whatever it is. You want to build in that money to that loan um, or to your projects so that you know that that job's going to get done and get done right. And you aren't going to be worrying about how you're going to finish it due to increased costs. So always talk to your contractor about contingency and always put that 10 to 15 percent in there. Um, in your head when you're thinking about cost. Next slide. Hey Allison, we have a question from Rebecca. She asks, will a contractor advise you about what is possible or do you need to know your own research? For example, can we fit a half bath in this closet and what would our layout options be? Absolutely, so you can talk to your contractor and ask, um, you should do a little bit of research on your own. So know where your water lines are. So on your first floor, is your closet near your kitchen? Um, is it just in the middle of nowhere? 
uh, when you're looking down in the basement, if you look underneath uh, where the closet is, if you can see that, um, you know, that's just going to tell you if the water lines are close by. Uh, and then also if that closet downstairs is maybe under the bathroom that's upstairs, or if you have a basement bathroom, like a just a toilet, um, you know, the soil stack that takes away our waste will be somewhere nearby. So just kind of doing a little bit of your own research, thinking about where things are in your house will be helpful. So when that contractor does come by, you can say, oh, I noticed there were some water lines here. And oh, my other bathroom is up here, so it's nearby. But definitely, um, the contractor that we are working with, actually, we finally found someone that we liked for our first floor bathroom, full bathroom put in. Um, he gave us a lot of creative ideas. You know, we had our initial drawings that again, aren't necessary. They were helpful to us, but are not necessary. Um, the contractor that we ultimately are hiring was very creative and offered a lot of helpful solutions. So I think you're going to find just by doing your gut check, by asking those questions, um, whether or not that person is truly creative. I had one person come in and had no ideas, literally nothing. They looked at our plan and said, we can do that. Here's a price. There was no creativity. There was nothing. And so I knew if I wanted to follow my plans exactly, this was the guy. He wasn't going to try to add in any bells or whistles. He was going to do exactly what I had on this piece of paper. He was not the guy for me because I wasn't necessarily wedded to that initial drawing. So um, by just asking and engaging, you will find out if they are creative. Uh, and can offer plans because ultimately you're going to have to submit those plans to the building department so they're going to be able to tell you what's legit what's not by granting your permit uh, so you could go ahead and start that creative process with that contractor and then just know that that through the drawings and the permitting process anything that's not legit will not be able to go forward so go ahead ask them to be creative with you great and uh, okay. nancy just wanted to note that she uh, held final payment until the contractor removed the old tub from her front porch. So good job, Nancy. Oh, Nancy, you are a superhero and good for you. Uh, yeah, good for you. Use your money. You're the boss. Uh, if we were in person, I would be like high-fiving you right now. So Nancy, you get a high-five. Great job. Okay. So last steps before signing the contract. Um, so Understanding a time frame expectation, right? So when I got my work done on my second floor, my drywall work and my molding work, they told me, Allison, this is going to be so easy. It's going to be like a month. Well, it was two and a half months. So understanding, have them tell you, ask them if they're doing other jobs. Will they only be focusing on your job? Will they be popping around? So my problem was, they had one guy who was the carpenter, and he was bebopping around to other projects. Again, my life was, it was, we were moving everything around. It was a little stressful, but because I was holding my payments, at least I had my money. I was happy about that. At the end of the day, to me, the money was the most important thing. I can sleep in my uh, office as long as I needed to while moving everything around. It was, I had my money, and that allowed me to sleep at night. So when are these people going to start your work? How many other projects are they working on at one time? Will they be solely dedicated to your project? Or what, you know, what's the flow going to be between the other projects that they are working on other projects? Uh, how long will it take? And you need to think about that. So no job is going to be done exactly as they say it's going to, right? There's going to be a hiccup here or there. It's 2020. Look where we've been so far. So just be prepared for that. Um, so, for instance, I couldn't start my kitchen project in the middle of winter because there's no way for me to cook food. We are planning on doing it, hopefully, this summer because we know we can grill. Um, they can move our refrigerator out uh, onto into our garage or onto our front porch, which is enclosed, uh, so you couldn't see it. Um, so not everyone can move their refrigerator to their front porch. But, um, you know, so really having an expectation. Do you only have one bathroom in your house? Are they going to be doing work on that one bathroom? How long is it going to take? How long are you going to be without a toilet? Or how long are you going to be without a shower? 
Um, and I hate to say it, but we need to take this current situation into account, our, um, you know, our sheltering in place into account, because, you know, if you only have one bathroom, you could go shower at the gym, but the gyms, you know, aren't opening for a couple of weeks or, you know, whatever. Just make sure you think about your daily life and how your life will be affected uh, by these um, improvements. So turning the closet into a bathroom isn't going to really change your life because you probably have another working bathroom uh, in the house. So just thinking about that, what kind of materials are they using? Just make sure you're okay with those materials. Who's going to be providing them? Make sure it's spelled out. Is it the material costs are included in your estimate, so the contractor is going to take care of that? Or are you buying the materials? Um, are you reimbursing the contractor for the materials? Or are you physically going to buy the materials and have them waiting for the person? So just make sure that's all spelled out. Next slide. Is this a permit job? We've talked about the importance of permit. Um, I'm not going to be the lady who tells you you have to get a permit for everything. Um, I encourage you to get a permit for all jobs that need a permit, uh, but I understand that that doesn't happen all the time. Um, I just want to explain to you the difference between the two types of permits. So there's a homeowner permit that can be pulled uh, through the city, and there's a contractor permit. There's pros and cons to both. A homeowner permit means that you as a homeowner are responsible for the work that's being done with the permit. It costs less money, but really it's not that much of a difference. Uh, the only time you should pull a homeowner permit is if you're doing the work yourself, because you know what you're doing, you're cool, you're gonna change out the hot water tank, you've done it before, you're gonna pull the permit, you just want the city to come out and check it and make sure you did it correctly. Um, that's the only time you should be pulling a homeowner permit. If a contractor tells you, why don't you pull the permit, it's gonna save you money, it's all cool, it's gonna be way easier if you pull the permit, that is a red flag and you should not hire that person. Unless it's a friend who's doing you a solid, then you can go ahead if you trust them to pull that homeowner permit. Because at the end of the day, you are responsible. I don't know anything about replumbing my bathtub. I am not going to pull a permit about moving my bathtub across to the other side and redoing the plumbing. I am not going to pull a permit on that because I do not know what to do with that. I would probably pull a permit on my hot water tank because I know how to do that. Now, a contractor pulls the permit, he's responsible. So if they go ahead and install that bathroom in the closet and they do it wrong, the contractor is held responsible to make sure they fix the things that were not done correctly. That is the pro of the permit. The con, I guess, is going to cost you a little bit more money, but ultimately you're holding, it's just a second check in this whole process to make sure that your contractor is doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're doing it to code and everything has been done up to snuff and you can go ahead and pay them. Uh, next slide. All right, so we signed our contracts, we've checked on our permits, we're feeling good, we're excited, it's game day, the job's about to start. Before it starts, you wanna think about a couple of things. So as I mentioned, um, I just heard a lot of horror stories, so that's where these things have come from. So what type of work is being done? Is there a lot of banging? Did your grandma paint the most beautiful mosaic something or other and it's hanging on your wall? Please take it down. Anything that's precious, your children's uh, ceramic footprints or whatever, your dog's paw print hanging on your wall. Take that down because you want to just make sure that it stays preserved and in one piece. Are you having a roof replacement done? Get everything out of the attic that's precious if your attic is not finished. If it is finished, the drywall is going to catch all that. It should be fine. But if it's an unfinished attic, remove everything or cover everything and then be prepared to get up there and vacuum everything up because there's going to be a little, a lot of little asphalt shingle debris up there. Next slide. Okay, exterior painting. You're going to get your siding, your wood siding replaced. I think when someone's doing that. Um, and then you're probably going to get it painted after that. Any exterior work that's being done on your house, 
know that they're going to be putting up ladders or they're going to be putting down tarps. If you have any prized petunias, any fancy plants, anything out there, make sure you identify it, you put something around it, and you say, please do not step on this. This won the best prize at the county fair, whatever it is. Identify it, say, do not step on this. Or just be okay with them stepping on your plants. But your plants are going to be mushed. They'll come back up. Uh, but just be aware um, that it will be covered and will be walked up. Next slide. During the construction period, and this is what I was telling you about earlier. Um, I like to make my presence known. Uh, for those of you who do know me in person, I tend to do that a lot. I just want people to know that I'm there. And that just because I'm female doesn't mean that I can't come up to you and ask questions. It also doesn't mean that I don't know what I'm talking about. So I like to ask questions. I like to sit out with my chair and my lemonade and watch what's happening. I like to, you know, say, did you find anything that you weren't expecting up there? Did you have to replace anything that you weren't anticipating? Um, you know, get your friends over there to sit with you if you aren't feeling very comfortable being alone with workers. Um, but you need to be home when work is being done. That is the moral of the story. You can't go to work and just hope for the best. That is something that cannot be done because if something goes wrong and you weren't there to call them out on it, it's probably not going to get fixed. Plus, you want them to know that they need to do the best job that they can. They can't just slap something up there and call it a day. You want to be home. Or if they have questions, I make sure that if something is found that was not anticipated and was not involved in the cost of my estimate, they need to stop work and tell me. I learned that the, long, the wrong way in a plumbing repair in my basement. Again, that happened early on in me being a homeowner. They charged me double the price for repairing a pipe, and I called them out on it. I was very proud of myself being, I was about 26 years old. You did not tell me, no one stopped and said this was a problem. You went to the hardware store, you're charging me all this money for transportation. I don't even know if you were gone this long. And they actually cut the bill in half. So being there, by being there, I was able to call them out on some things that I thought was an unfair practice and get the price reduced. I spoke up, I spoke out, and I was there. And those things are very, very important to ensure that you do not get taken advantage of. So you literally don't need to sit in the front yard with your lemonade and your lawn chairs, but you do need to make your presence known. Say, I'm here if you have any questions. Um, sometimes uh, people also ask, should construction workers use my bathroom? That's up to you. Uh, if you have a bathroom in the basement that you want people to use or if you feel comfortable using your first floor bathroom but it is also okay for you to say there's a mcdonald's down the street um if you'll need to use that bathroom that is something that is okay to say and feel and know that you can say that and it's acceptable next slide Okay, so the work has been completed, we're high-fiving, we're so excited, we're feeling accomplished, uh, but we don't wanna pay them just yet. We wanna, if it's a permit job, make sure that the inspector comes out and uh, gives it the okay. I had some siding work done. Siding replacement is a permit job. Uh, I had vinyl siding, I had it replaced. And they claimed that the inspector came out and gave it the okay and they were ready for their payment. And there was no green sticker. If an inspector comes out, they put a green sticker on the repair to let you know that they've been there and it's been approved. You probably see it on your furnace or a hot water tank or something like that around your house. And I did not pay them until the inspector came out and gave me the okay. I refused. They said, well, they've been out. Well, I don't see a green sticker anywhere. So you can call the building department and tell them that I would like them to call me or I can. I ultimately called and said, did you come out? And they said no, so I waited till they came out and approved it. They stood there and looked at it and said it looked fine, but still the, the whole purpose was, this is a permit job, I need the building department to sign off on it before I'm going to pay you. So make sure you do that. And next slide. Okay, and then ultimately the stomach test. Are you happy with the job? If no, why? 
we have some clients who are just never happy. Um, and I, and I hate to say that, but sometimes they're just not able to be pleased. They really expect a lot, especially if they're paying a contractor who was maybe the lowest price and they're hoping to get what they were going to get from the highest price contractor. You know, that's not always going to be the case. So if you are unhappy, kind of deep, take a deep dive and understand why you're not happy. If it's a legit reason, something that can be fixed, demand that it gets fixed. Uh, if it's something that I picked the wrong house color, that's on you, unfortunately. You, and it looks good, you should probably pay your contractor. Um, and I don't know why this is in here, and I apologize. We don't have contractor evaluation forms any longer. But you still can call us up uh, and let us know uh, how the job went. You can, um, you know, put out rating, a positive rating on the Better Business Bureau or Angie's List. Um, and just, you know, spread the good word that you found a good contractor because they are hard to find. Um, next slide. Okay. And then after it's all said and done, you're happy, the work is done, uh, you want to keep your paperwork in one place. There are apps that you can download. Um, <clears throat> one is through Brightnest. Another is through, uh, I'm blanking, if you are interested in the apps, feel free to let me know. That's usually in how our home maintenance workshop um, where we talk about the apps. But the apps are important because you can just keep everything in your phone. When you got your new furnace, last time it was cleaned, or what type of roofing material you have, what the warranty is on it, what the color of the shingle is, so that if there's a repair that needs to be done later on, you'll have all that information in one place. I highly recommend it for interior painting. I don't know about you, but I've had to do a few um, repairs and paint, and I'm always off by one shade on my paint colors. I um, often talk the talk. I don't always walk the walk. I try. I try, I try. Um, so just keeping all that information in one place. So whether that is a fire safe and you have it all together or a filing cabinet or a phone app, wherever you want it to be or a Word document, make sure you keep everything in one place. Because when something goes wrong, we have an older home, that may happen, you have the ability to quickly find the information so that you can get it repaired or get it taken care of or get a new can of paint quickly and then you can move on to something else. Uh, and again, with the warranties, just something that I've learned to ask is the warranty information, is that something that you need to send in or something that your contractor needs to send in? Sometimes the contractor needs to send it in because they're certified to install that product. So whether it's a furnace or a certain type of roofing shingle, they may need to be the ones where there's other things like a, um, stove or a dishwasher or a dehumidifier or something where you need to be the one who sends in the warranty information. So just do your due diligence, ask questions, make sure it gets sent in, and then keep it all in one place. Next slide. All right, also keep payment records. This doesn't happen very frequently anymore, uh, but it, you know, someone can come back to you and say, you still owe me money. Uh, and there are contractors who have filed like a mechanics lien uh, on con on homeowners if they claim that they haven't paid and the homeowner can't show proof. So, you know, now in this digital age, it's not as important. But if you are someone who writes a check or want to pay in cash for whatever reason, um, you know, make sure you document how you paid, when you paid, uh, and keep it handy. Um, and then also keep a record of all warranty work that's being done. So if you have kind of a lemon of a product, meaning you got a new air conditioner and someone has to come out and service it all the time, it's just not working right, you want to keep all that documented information in one place so you can say, hey, guys, I've got a lemon. You need to come in and replace it. You've done too much work. Uh, so just staying organized is very important because it will save you time, money, and tears in the long run. Next slide. We've already talked about this um, pretty much. So just make sure you keep everything handy. Uh, know your colors because uh, it will save you, again, time, money, and tears in the long run. Next slide. Okay. So um, this is a little bit different, uh, but I do want to tell everyone about it. It does 
fit into how to contract a repair. So um, Dominion East Ohio Gas, and this pro program is still operating. I'm not sure for how much longer, but it is a great program. Uh, and we can send out the information to you if you're interested. Uh, Dominion East Ohio Gas partners with a company called Clear Result. And Clear Result will come in and do a home energy assessment for you. If you mention Lakewood Alive, it's free. So they'll come out and do a energy audit on your home, tell you where you're losing heat uh, or energy, where you're insulated versus where you're not. They do a blower door test, which will um, tell you where your windows and doors are leaking. I have to tell you, these things provide me anxiety. I am someone who really likes to achieve and I don't want my house to fail. I love my house like a person, it's, it's a thing. So uh, the energy audit causes me a little anxiety. Don't be like me, do the energy audit uh, because it will help you make informed decisions about improvements. So if you're thinking about getting your house insulated, which insulation is awesome, key, will save you tons of money in the long run. Or if you're thinking about getting new windows, which is a whole other workshop, but insulation over windows any day of the week, if you ask me. But you know, if you're gonna get your new windows, if you're gonna get new doors, if you're going to get insulation, if you're thinking about putting in a new furnace, the energy audit is the way to go because if you make those improvements within a year of getting the energy audit, Dominion East Ohio Gas will give you rebates on those improvements. So those high gas bills that you pay, will get some of that money back from Dominion. Uh, and this is a shameless plug, but we are a nonprofit and we work really hard and um, the funds that come to us are very, very important. So if you do get an energy audit done through Clear Result, if you mention Lakewood Alive, again, it will be free for you and they will make a donation to Lakewood Alive for $25. So win-win, we all get money from the gas company, win-win-win. Um, so we can send out that information to you uh, if you're interested. So again, uh, energy audit is real important. They do give you a readout. It's not going to blow your mind. Uh, it's a free assessment, but it will, again, help you make informed decisions about improvements and will open up some rebates for you on improvements. Um, they will check your hot water tank, check your furnace, uh, as well as leave you with um, uh, energy saving light bulbs, LEDs. Uh, they do have an offer for, um, I think it's a $100 Nest thermostat. So the smart thermostats, um, they will install one for you at a deeply discounted price. So it's definitely worth checking out um, and we're happy to share that information with you. So I am now at the end of my presentation. Um, my contact information is here. Again, we are not in the office, so don't stop by, but you can call me, you can email me, uh, you can send us a message on Facebook. You know, you can get to us multiple ways and we would love to chat with you about your repairs uh, and continue these individual conversations that we've been having. Again, we're so excited uh, you're looking to make improvements to your house. We want to make sure you do that the best way possible. Um, so um, that's where I'm going to stop. Ian, any additional thoughts, questions from the lovely audience? Uh, no questions uh, since we heard from Nancy. Uh, so uh, we can just give it another moment or two if uh, anybody has anything for Allison. Great. And um, I'm going to see if I can find that clear result information real fast. Uh, so um, our next workshop is this Saturday, our uh, Knowing Your Home how, um, Kitchen and Bathroom Remodeling. That is going to be a virtual webinar. We will be doing webinars all summer. Uh, we'll be partnering with Cleveland Lumber on that. And then Universal Design, um, a very exciting workshop that's June 11th. Um, that's going to be hosted by Maximum Accessible Housing of Ohio. Universal Design is a concept that really talks about making your home accessible to all ages. So making your home most useful to your young children and then change in function as everyone gets older, especially as we get older, our houses become a little bit more complicated for us. 
So making improvements like bathrooms and kitchens, uh, we will be able to encourage you to make certain improvements that will help and last throughout the life cycle of you and your home, uh, making it safe um, and accessible for, as I mentioned, people of all ages. So that's June 11th uh, from 7 to 8.30. Um, and again, that will be virtual as well. So um, you will get an email from us um, that will have the clear result information in it. So you can feel free to take advantage of that. Again, please mention Lakewood Alive. Uh, your home assessment will be free and Lakewood Alive will receive a $25 donation. Um, anything else, Ian? Uh, Rebecca just wanted to uh, chime in and say thank you, all capital letters. Uh, thanks, Rebecca, for the enthusiasm. She says, we're new to Ohio, so it's great to know these resources exist. Uh, great community here in Lakewood. So, Rebecca, uh, thank you for that. And Jane uh, also chimed in and said this was very helpful. And uh, Thanks so much. So, Rebecca and Jane, thank you for that. That's all we yeah, have. Yeah, thank you. And, Rebecca, wel welcome to Lakewood. Thanks for making uh, Lakewood your home. Um, uh, we think it's a pretty great place. So, welcome. Um, and, again, thank you all for taking time out of your busy days uh, to spend with us. Um, we're excited to be able to connect with you. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. My contact information is here. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Knowing Your Home workshop on Saturday. Have a great evening.